designed to help LGBTQ travelers navigate the world in the simple form of a flag. The new album that reimagines classic wedding songs to be more inclusive of the LGBTQ community. Connected to the smartphone via Bluetooth, access to mobile communication with the first real smartwatch. Forbidden stories, an international network of journalists designed to finish these stories and the investigations. If all our government and president can do is send thoughts and prayers, then it's time for victims to be the change that we need to see. Asking people to stop using single-use plastic straws. The longer we delay, I worry that we might not be able to recover. You are not going to let that word hurt you. You are not pretty for a black girl. You are beautiful, period. <laughs> Hello everyone, um, my name is Patrick Burgoyne, I'm a trustee here at DNAD. Um, some of you may remember me from uh, my former life as editor of Creator Review. Um, so you just saw a film there about uh, DNAD Impact, and Impact is a scheme that DNAD launched I think four years, it's into its fourth year now, and it's our attempt to recognize creative ideas that are driving positive change in the world. It's about recognizing that our community can do more than drive profit and growth and provide a mechanism for showcasing, rewarding, encouraging that kind of work. Um, I should say, plug, that it's open for entries currently and it will be until um, Wednesday the 25th of September. It's a piece in the puzzle uh, around the issues that we're going to talk about tonight. And uh, I think the fact that there's so many of you here, and there's going to be so many of us on stage, is testament to the urgency of uh, the issues that we're going to talk about tonight. So I'd like to invite the uh, panel to come up and join me, please, ladies and gentlemen. So you can see it's a cast of thousands. Um, I'm going to ask everyone to introduce themselves, starting with uh, Naresh at the end. Um, Nick, would you mind passing the microphone on? Uh, what type of introduction? Short one? Who Nare are you? I'm, I'm what Naresh. are you doing here? Um, oh, what am I doing here? Um, because, um, what, really? A long answer? Uh, no. Sorry, Naresh, um, uh, co-founder of Do the Green Thing and a partner at Pentagram, uh, very interested in how, uh, in the role of creativity in, in the first place, um, contributing to the problem, and in the second place, helping to find the answer. I don't do any of those things. <laughs> I'm Peter Sita, I'm a former president of DNAD, and the current chairman of TBWA, and in my spare time, I try to do something vaguely good with the powers we've all been given. Hi, I'm Nick, I'm the uh, brand marketing lead at Art Bible, um, and for us, we like to kind of really hero social issues that matter most to 18 to 30 year olds, and obviously the environment is one. Uh, amongst others, and I'll hopefully talk about some of the stuff that we've, we've done to kind of talk about that issue. Uh, I'm Natalie, I'm one of the co-founders of Uncommon uh, Creative Studio, and I guess uh, I'm here because uh, the world's on fire, our industry probably needs to recognise and wake up to the fact that we need to change, and uh, I definitely don't have all the answers, but I think collectively we can get there, so uh, I'm here to learn as well as talk. I've got one. Ah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sophie Thomas. I'm founding director of Thomas Matthews Communication Design. Um, our work is about positive impact. We are a graphic design communication company, so not advertising. Um, we've been working in the field of sustainability for 21 years. Um, I'm always on a panel like this, I have to say. <laughs> but um, I think actually it's time that I'm not and other people are on it as well. It's good to be here with a good group of people. Hi, everyone. I'm Rob, I'm the co-founder of the Pair Disruptors, and we were responsible for holding the first pan-industry summit on how 
might we collectively as an industry respond to, help, uh, to the climate crisis and help limit global warming to 1.5 degrees? And that was in response to a letter, Extinction Rebellion, published in the trade press back in Easter. Uh, I'm Ian Tate, one of the executive creative directors of Wyden and Kennedy in London. Um, but I'm here really as a human being and a father to two kids who are 10 years old and, you know, really concerned about what, we, what we've done to the planet and what we continue to do. And so this is as much like a personal thing as it is a professional thing. And I think trying to bring those two things together with our responsibilities as, as, as people, fathers, mothers, grandparents, whatever it may be, I think is, is the thing that we all need to kind of concern ourselves with every day. Hi, I'm Will Skeeping. I'm an activist with Extinction Rebellion, co-editor of our handbook, This Is Not A Drill. Um, I was involved in the challenge we made to the advertising industry to do a lot of truth-telling and do a lot more to sort of help and play a part in this, solving this crisis. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's great to be here, and I really hope we can bash out some ideas. Thanks, all. Um, so I'm going to be kind of... I don't want this to be your usual stilted panel discussion. So if at any point during the evening, not, don't just wait to the end, you want to ask a question, make a point, please stick your hand up and I'll come to you, Jerry Springer style, and we'll uh, take your point of view in, into account as well. But as you can see, there's a lot of people here and we're going to do our best to uh, get the views of everyone. But design advertising's responsibilities to society and to the world around us, this is not new territory for uh, a lot of us, I'm sure a lot of people in, in this room. I mean, when I think back to the First Things First Manifesto, which I think a lot of people in this room will be uh, well aware of, that was published in 1964. And it feels like we're still hammering away at some of the, the same issues. However, this time it feels different, this time it feels more urgent, and I think Extinction Rebellion's open letter to the advertising industry played a big role in that and certainly there seems to have been I think an unprecedented response from the industry to that so I, I'd just like to start off um, Will by asking you about that letter the intention what you hope to see from it and what you've seen so far from it sure um, so that was we don't do anything as individuals in Extinction Rebellion so that was written as a sort of communal effort particularly by two amazing copywriters uh, um, who sort of finally penned the, the final version uh, who are, one is an ex-director at Mother, I think, and the other one is a journalist, um, both uh, women, so it's not all guys over here sort of just shouting away. Um, and we knew that we had to start challenging any industry that has a platform and influence uh, that can help tell the truth about the climate and ecological emergency. So just as a quick sort of update framing of where we are, when we talk about this being a little bit sort of urgent and things have moved on, it's very, very, very drastic. If you haven't really got your head around how bad it is and how bad everything is going, just be aware that there's a very small chance you'll be doing what you do professionally now uh, in five or ten years' time because when the food runs out or civilization begins to collapse around us, you won't give a shit about design and advertising. Um, so... We're coming from a fairly dark place, but we're also coming from a place of like uh, courage, I think, rather than hope, and one in which we recognize that everybody needs to start getting with the program and understanding, uh, getting through their grief and beginning to sort of act. So we're also challenging the fashion industry, again, like hugely influential um, and also hugely part of the problem. And I'd say to a degree, and I used to work in advertising, I used to work at McCann for a couple of years. I've done lots of creative and strategy sort of... Uh, Freelancing, did brand strategy for startups, got a terrible carbon footprint, spent a lot of time in America, lots of mini breaks in Berlin, you know, all the same shit we all do. And I finally come to terms with this and realized that we all need to be changing what we're doing. Business as usual in its current, in, in, all, in all its ways, is going to have to change. And it doesn't just mean a change to vegan food in your canteen in your workplace. It means drastically rethinking the lens through which you see all decision making, all ideation, all strategic thought, and more importantly, how you talk to your audiences, both now and those ones in the future, and those Gen Z that everyone's madly in love with, but also how you talk to your clients, and how you explain the nature of this emergency, and how as mediators between brands and audiences, you begin to wake up. And we felt that with my, what I felt, with my experience in that industry, I was best placed to have a pop at it. But um, 
there's plenty of other people, and if you've got any experience within business, come and join us and help have a pop at your, get some revenge. And, and what do you make of what's happened so far after the publication of that letter? I mean, so, hey, this guy, one of the first agencies we went to see in, like, got it immediately. Widening Kennedy as an agency really grasped this, like, massive shout out, because since then we've been to see loads of other agencies, especially the big network ones, and they haven't grasped this at all. They've are sort of at some point in their kind of grief spectrum where they're in a sort of denial or a removal from their own position within this scenario. And it's really great when you do work or speak with a company that gets it and immediately starts talking about really drastic, drastic top-down changes, even to the point of going, what do we do after advertising? I think the hardest thing, though, is, you know... Uh, it's still too slow. Like, what we're doing, and we can talk a bit about it later if you want to, but, like, what we're doing still has this sense of, like, it's so much slower than it has to be and so much slower than I would like it to be. And it's funny, actually, at the event that Rob put on, I was in a group with, with someone who was slightly more activist from Bristol, and he was like, okay, so what does it, what does it mean for your Christmas campaigns? And I was like, well, we're shooting the Christmas campaigns now. Like, do you know what I mean? They're going to be out. And it's just like, oh, shit. Like, we should... If we don't change that now, like that's another Christmas gone by where we're basically pumping the same messages out. And it's like that degree of urgency, like I suddenly realized that like I was already immediately making excuses why we couldn't make a change for something that was kind of effectively, and this was a, probably a month ago, it's like this is months away. And actually in the time frames we're talking about, it, you know, 2050, that's bullshit. 2030, that's too far out. Like actually we need to be acting really severely now because actually you know we need to be topping out our use and coming down the other side and what's happening is that we're actually still accelerating on our kind of carbon on our carbon footprints so you know for all of this like oh yeah we can do things in small small steps like yeah it's important to have on ramps that doesn't that don't freak people out but once you engage with it the importance of like that level of scale just all of a sudden kind of kind of really hits you and sorry, I'm not going to hog the mic, I promise. We went to see a client the other day who, like, they're doing good stuff. And it's like, oh, we've planted three million trees in the last couple of years. And it's like, well, that's cool. But did you see that Ethiopia managed to plant 353 million trees in 12 hours the other day? And you kind of go, fuck me. Like, some people out there are doing things at scale that are really big and important. And you just, like, we're looking at the wrong examples. And we're looking at the wrong levels of scale as being the things that we celebrate. And so I urge all of us to kind of go and look at the things that can make the biggest shift as quickly as we possibly can. Because we're all conditioned to be thinking in the cycles that we normally think about. And I'm as guilty as every one of that. Um, Rob, tell us about how Purpose Disruptors uh, responded to this and, and the work that you're doing, um, the work you've done and the ongoing work that you're doing to provide some ways forward for, for, for everybody who works in this industry. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Very happy to. So what the, the great thing that the Extension Rebellion Letter did was sort of create, that, open up the space for all the organizations, all the people in our industry and other industries who have, been, who have connected with the reality of climate crisis, connected with the science, but have also connected with the idea that they can make a difference from where they stand. So Purpose Draft has, has been going on for about 12 months. Um, it was set up by a group of advertising insiders, people like me who connected with the reality of climate crisis, but also believed our industry had the power to make a difference, that we could be part of the solution and not be, just be part of the problem. So we held up pu monthly pub nights just to understand, are there other people like us who are holding these same questions? How can we make our industry more purposeful, more responsible, and respond to climate crisis? And people kept coming. Like the month, every month, more and more people came. Um, people from all across the industry, young creators, fresh out of ad school to more senior people, all seeking to understand how we as an industry can make a difference. And when Extension Rebellion um, published their letter, now that was like, we were like, right, okay, this is it. How do we, how, who's going to respond to this? And when we saw the responses in, 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 the, in the trade press, we felt no one really answered the brief that that letter was calling out. Um, so we wrote our own letter um, asking how can we collectively, as an industry, given the point that Ian made, that you know, we required unprecedented change at scale. So how can we, as an industry, transcend competition, work collectively to come up with a really meaningful way to, to direct our creativity, our strategic firepower to make that difference. So that letter um, got signed by over 50 CEOs and founders from across the industry. 
And what was fascinating to observe about that was this, this sort of latent desire in our industry to respond to this, that people were aware of this and wanted to act, but did not know how. So we held a summit, and to the, to the point that Will made about how do you help people understand, process that grief. So the summit was designed in a way that where, we in, where we invited people to understand the reality, the scale and urgency of climate crisis, but also know that there were people who designed that summit have understood the reality but are still in the industry because we believe we can make a difference. So processing that grief and that emotion into positivity. So off the back of that summit, we now have five um, working groups, cross-agency, transcending competition, kind of really meaningful ways to, uh, yeah, to make a difference. And one of the first things that's emerged is this initiative called Create and Strike, which some of you might have seen in the campaign last week. So we're asking, asking us to sort of apply our creative talent to sort of amplify that, that message from the student strike movement. There's some people in the room who are involved in that, I can see. Um, and yeah, to go on strike as well, to sort of show solidarity with, with, the, with the young people of today. Sophie, I mean, you said that you're, you're always on panels like this and you <laughs> feel like you've been doing this for so many I'm just years Just an old lady. Now. Give us a bit of historical context here because, you know, we have been down this road before, maybe not with the same... Yeah, not so urgent, I yeah. think, that's the difference. So, um, so when we set up Thomas Matthews 21 years ago, we, uh, we were sitting, Christy and I were sitting around a table trying to work out what our logo should be or what our name should be and ended up writing a manifesto and had, like, saving the planet in it, you know, it's kind of... But actually... Building a, um, an agency at that point which had sustainability right at its heart was kind of really unheard of and quite difficult. And then 10 years ago, I was talking to John over there and we were talking about the fact that we feel like we were, we were having the same conversations then as we are now, but everything's just become more urgent. And we were having conversations where the response was, let's do a campaign where we tell people to turn off their lights or the polar bear gets it. And that was the kind of approach from, the, from, you know, from our industry. I'm like, that is not going to make a blind bit of difference, maybe to the polar bear, but um, you know, not, to, not to actually where we're going to be ending up. And now we're at that point where we're sort of just getting closer and closer to this deadline. And still, you're thinking, what will be people's actions? You know, it's really amazing that you can get people, you can galvanize, galvanize people, but what do people do? And when you start unpicking it, and really, A, looking at your clients, looking at how you create stuff, you know, thinking about how you spec things. You know, if we think about the environmental impact of design, so 80% of that environmental impact is at predetermined at concept design stage. So as soon as we start thinking about an idea, how it will be produced, what kind of things it's made of, who's going to work on it, we're immediately building in all that impact. And if we could train ourselves and educate ourselves to come to a point where that becomes a positive, you know, so that we are all climate activists, but we do it within our work, we could actually make that into a, you know, we can reverse where we're at. And we can think about, not about, I like Papanek, I've been reading his work again, and it's all about like, we design things, we, we get people to buy things they don't want, need, with money they don't have, to impress people that they don't, who don't care. And I think that really sums it up for me. You know, actually, we need... It's, it's about kind of pr proper, proper design. Design is really important. I mean, I think we can't... It's not that we're saying that we should all go and give up our day jobs and do something else. And it's, uh, it's really, really fundamental to get good ideas, proper ideas that really affect the way we live, um, the way we eat, all these kind of things, as well as the st how long our stuff lasts, all those kind of things. So... It's not dismissive of that, but we just, we just don't do it properly or we don't have enough knowledge about where we can find that information. Um, Peter, tell us about where are we now in terms of clients and the conversations that you're having with clients around these kinds of issues? How far up their agenda is it? How willing are they to change? And, and realistically, how much influence can an advertising agency have? I have a slight feeling I'm being set up as the greed is good man here. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it's very interesting looking out at the room. So there are a lot of very young people in this room. I know one person who started work last week. So it is possible to listen to this and think we're all fucked. And I, 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 met, um, I met William a few weeks ago. And uh, uh, I don't often have a meeting that doesn't go the way I think. So I thought he'd call me up 
to talk about doing a campaign, thinking of a line, getting people interested, maybe make a film, blah, blah, blah. And one of the things he wanted me to talk about was to persuade all of my friends to stop work. <laughs> so everybody in advertising stop advertising. I, I think this is really fundamental. Okay, and it's a bit early for you to start working after a week. Um, we all have to buy less. We all have to use less. But I think there is an argument to be said for buying better and buying less. We were just talking about the brands that are trying to... Um, it's actually a, a line from Coco Chanel. It's from the 1930s, buy better, buy less. Buy one thing that you wear for a really long time and get full value out of it. Um, a lot of us are in the design industry, so um, uh, when I was a kid, you went and bought a loaf of bread and you put it in the bag that you brought, and all of the layers of packaging that's been built up have only come together in our lifetime. So they can be unpicked in our lifetime. They can be this, at least one person who's a contemporary, God bless you. Humanity over everything, this chap says on his chest. Isn't that great? So uh, uh, um, it, it is true that uh, we can all do lots of little things, but if we were all able to do one thing, it would be to try and work with the clients that we have already, not to plant a tree and then fucking forget it, but to work out how we can persuade people to sustain the life that we have which, let's face it, everybody in this room is uh, our job. Anybody not in the flogging business, either in design or advertising? Okay, bless you. What do you do? <laughs> One nurse in the room. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, what we have to think about is how we can be useful to the... I, I love Extinction Rebellion because the name is brilliant, isn't it? Is it raises the stakes. It's not about someone else that's dying. It's about me and everybody who's going to come from me not being here anymore, that's really powerful, uh, agenda-changing um, pair of words. However, I'm trying not to say but, um, one of the things that we can do now is not have a couple of clients that um, win charity prizes and a whole bunch of others that pay everybody's wages, but try and look at um, our skills. So everybody in this room uses words, pictures, and insights, strategists, to make people do something or buy something. Okay, those are the skills that we have. And we can use them for tremendous good, I think. Not just in the other campaigns that we do, but in the big campaigns that we do. Can we make our clients think about what it means to make something and have people use it? Um, there's a piece of copywriting which I really like is from the 90s, which is don't throw anything away, there is no way. Okay, that's really brilliant craftsmanship in the trade that, who are the, who are the copywriters in the room? Words people? Not many copywriters, what does that tell you? <laughs> how, many, how many pictures people, how many designers? So you obviously care much more than the <laughs> That's really interesting. So all I would say is, you know, I, I've talked to William a lot. You know, we were talking a minute ago um, about the fact that uh, three years ago you'd go in a pub and you'd stink of cigarettes when you came out. It is possible to get people to make change immediately, as Ian was saying. Make it now, make it affect them this week. It just takes really powerful communications. So I would say, those of you who've only just started working in the business, don't give up. And, um, well, you might disagree. <laughs> um, but use your powers for good. Has that even vaguely answered your question? It wasn't really, was it? Yeah, kind of. We'll, we'll get to some more <laughs> difficult questions later. Um, Naresh, you're another person who's been engaged in these kinds of issues for a long time. And I wonder how you see the, project, the, the tra trajectory of how we're addressing these issues in the creative industries changing. I mean, even back in the days when you were... At St. Luke's, you were, you were engaged very, very, very strongly with, it, with this, these issues. Um, yeah, well, I think the, um, I think the creative industry um, is engaging um, because, look, um, and um, I, did a, I did a talk at um, DNAD, the festival this year, and I think if I'd done it last year, there would have been about 10 people in the room, and um, there were like 100 people in the room. So I think the issue is um, one that's important to people, Creative people are people, so they're interested. I think that's what's happening. Um, I think there's a sense of, um, uh, some sense of um, responsibility and guilt around the issue um, in the, um, uh, you know, Peter's right in a way that, you know, there's, there's one, one problem which is about um, um, the wrong kind of stuff being um, marketed by us indiscriminately, making it more attractive, making more people buy it, and therefore, you know, that's a problem. Uh, there's another problem, which is that um, there's not enough good stuff for us all to work on. So, um, every, or to put it another way, sort of every single product that's out there that gets promoted, you know, that, that, that's got a business behind it, 
needs to be promoted, um, and therefore we're the people who promote the ball. We're a big industry. We're, we're contributing to all the industries, and that equals overconsumption. That's another problem, I would say. Um, and then I think where I disagree um, with Peter is that um, I think it's a really tough gig uh, to get on to the end of... Um, I think we're at the end of other people's deliverables. Um, we, we do a thing called marketing, whether you like that word or not, and other people have decided already what comes to the market, and we're basically putting a nice sign on it. Uh, I think the decisions have already been made. I think it's really tough for us at the end of the process to tell clients to change their business, because I think that's already happened. And I think there, there probably isn't enough good business for us all to go round. So when Will says, um, you know, when Will is asking for this industry to shrink, I sort of understand what he means. Yeah. Uh, we're fine. Um, we're a small team uh, of five people, um, and uh, we have a great network of people who help around it. And um, we're pentagram by day, do the green thing by night, and under both circumstances, uh, in both guises, we get to work with fantastic people who are uh, businesses, largely who are um, conscious of some of the issue, some issues or these social social issues or these issues, and uh, we're working with them or um, you know activist charities. Uh, or foundations who are looking to um, protest or change frameworks or both. Um, and so that's our five people team engaged fully in largely, I think, the right kind of work. Can that scale up to the size of the industry? I don't know. Um, can we change people's agendas when they come to us as, mar as marketeers? I don't think we can. Um, but I think there's loads of great stuff that the creative world can do. It just may not come from briefs from clients. It may be about initiatives that we have to start or join, uh, pro bono work for, um, or, or just kick off by ourselves, like do the green thing, I guess, or loads of other initiatives that are out there. So I think there's lots we can do. I think we're really brilliantly imaginative people who can translate complex ideas, connect with consumers, which is what needs to happen. Um, and I think we're really addicted to changing something. That's what we're, we, we like finding alternatives. And there's a system called consumption. We have to change that. So I think there's a huge job for us to do, maybe not through the client world. Natalie, what do you, th what do you think about that? Are you, are you more optimistic? I mean, we, we've heard a lot about uh, uh, recently the way agency and client relationships have maybe changed and that maybe agencies don't have the power and influence that they, they want did and they once did of maybe the kind of deep and long-lasting relationships that might allow them to propose some of these changes. I mean, what... What, what do you see at Uncommon and, and, and in your, your previous life at other agencies? Um, I mean, I guess, yes, I think agencies' power does feel like it's kind of waned a bit, and I agree with a lot of what Naresh was just saying. I think the, the difficulty is I think we've forgotten the fact that we're not a B2B supplier. We do have the chance to help people work out what they want to buy. And yes, we are on the receiving end of those briefs, but we could choose not to take the briefs. We could choose to not make certain companies more famous or make those things happen. That is a hard pillow f pill for all of us to swallow because actually it does mean jobs. It does mean what briefs are going around. But I think we do have a choice to be able to select those, those companies we believe who are doing it right that we should be getting behind and putting our power behind. And if we do believe in the power of what it is we all get out of bed to do, so changing behavior, getting people to buy stuff, then let's help them make the right decisions. And that in itself should help the people who aren't setting up businesses that are sustainable to recognize that that will hurt their, their wallet. Um, I, I realize that's still at the end of a, a situation, but I, do, but I think that is one thing we can be doing is to change the people that are heroed. William, you want to come in? Yeah, on? I was just going to jump in and say that um, this change isn't going to happen in isolation. So no one business is going to come along and be like, ha, look what we did. It was so smart. We all won an award for it, and that's great, and we're doing our bit. It's not going to work like that. It's not going to work if any one of you does a little snazzy campaign and everyone loves it. What's going to happen is that everyone's going to get together, and you're going to do this en masse. So you're all in a room. You've all, many of you shared workplaces, jobs, hobbies, creative interests, you've got to get together on this because individual action isn't going to cut it anymore. If we did this in 1980, 19, early 90s, perhaps we'd have business as usual to some degree. Perhaps we could all flex a little bit. But I'm afraid they fucked it and it's not going to happen. So what we need to do, and I'm sorry to sound like a you know, voice of 
the doom here, but the only way this is going to work is the way that we do it with movement building, where you guys need to get together, and if you're thinking, what am I going to do on the 7th of October when Extinction Rebellion comes back on the streets, what am I going to do to come out and support the kids on the 20th, which is great and, you know, really worth doing, you come and work from the streets, you know, you'll know how to hot desk, get an internet connection, block a road, Everyone in the entire creative industries, get out there, take over a big chunk of town and do your bit and make your mark and make it the creative, exciting, vibrant thing it is. And get your CEOs to change. And if your CEOs don't change, change your CEOs. Because, like, this can't go on. People in power, if they're not doing their job, then they've got to go. It's that simple. So, sorry to... <laughs> I mean, we saw... Um an example recently in the States with Ogilvy and the work that they were doing for the Customs and, and Border Protection Agency in the States, which really highlighted an issue, I think, where you had a very kind of idealistic young workforce who were very unhappy about uh, the work that an agency was doing and the client that they were working for. But then you had an agency CEO trying to kind of hold the line between running a business and satisfying the ideals of a, of, a, of a younger workforce. And I wonder how um, some of the panelists have in, encountered some of those problems and how leaders in this area are going to navigate what's going to be very difficult territory between business as usual, day-to-day -day keeping their companies going and their res wider responsibilities to shareholders, to uh, employees, to the clients they already have versus the urgency of the issues that, that, that we're facing. Ian, maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really good question. Uh, the thing that's been bubbling around my head as everyone's been talking is actually just exactly this. It's like, it's about leadership. And it's about, like, it's, uh, this thing of, like, you know, and it's, you know, I'm not saying that writing letters to each other isn't, isn't a noble art, but, you know, when you see this list of CEOs kind of signing letters, like, you know, a few of them are probably on the panel here, but, like, there is not many of them in the room, right? So there's these lists of 50 CEOs. It's like, but what are they actually doing apart from signing letters? And I think that thing of, like, figuring out, like, it, this common question of like, well, what can we do? It's like, probably not that much if you're in the photocopying room with a boss who doesn't let you do anything, right? It's like, you need leadership to actually be actively engaged with this. And if you, you know, I like Will's thing, I'm not saying that I'm going to overthrow the CEO tomorrow, but I'll give it a go. Um, luckily, he's kind of on side, but I think that's where I feel really fortunate. I've managed to kind of bring a load of people kind of along for the journey and some of them are still going well, what do we do about it but you need to have a top to bottom bunch of people all agreed that this is a common path of travel because otherwise you know you, you can have these pockets of activism within the agency that can stir up trouble and make things happen but really we all need to have agencies in order for them to work together the leaders need to believe that it's a thing that's worth spending some time and effort and some sacrifice on. And I think that's the big thing that, you know, this sense of sacrifice, like people want to be paid the same amount of money. They want to be, they want to continue with this lifestyle. And there is a degree of like personal sacrifice that I think once you know this stuff, you have to be willing to make in the short term. Because, you know, I look at this and I go, well, I, you know, I, I went to the global heads of the agency and said, oh, I want to spend all my time on this. And they were like, but how's that going to work? And it's like, well, okay, I'll spend all my time on it, but how about I take... And then I was like, wait, I'm, am I going to take a... And I, I'm being very personal. Like, am I suddenly admitting that I'm going to take a massive cut in salary to probably work way harder than everyone else to do this thing that actually I believe everyone needs to do? And it caused this, this personal turmoil in me to kind of go, actually, yeah, I should do that. And then it's like, fuck me, are you being a chump? Because everyone else is going to get paid the same amount to do the wrong thing. And that's ridiculous. Sophie, you wanted to come I in? I just wanted to say, there is another thing you can do. Um, and uh, 10 years into our business, we um, decided that we would become, or we're joining a trust. So we're now an employee-owned benefit trust. So everybody, we don't have CEOs. So we, we answer to ourselves. We have big meetings where we talk about things. Cl some clients that come in, um, are questioned and actually thrown out, and seriously questioned and thrown out. Um, and it does mean also, because we are like architects, structural engineers, communication designers, um, all together, we are actually, we declared the climate declaration for structural engineers, so, but as a trust. So now we have these ridiculous and brilliant set of targets to hit 
in terms of what we need to do as a trust. So there is a way of doing it. You don't, it's like actually there are new ways of doing business that don't have to have this kind of hierarchical triangle with somebody at the top saying, yeah, I hear you all, you really care about this, but actually if we get rid of this client, you're going to lose your job and that you don't want that, do you? And I think that's a ridiculous amount of pressure to put on people who actually, you know, it's about the fact that we should bring our belief system into our business. You shouldn't separate them. There was a point where, you know, we were taught to designers and they say, well, I have, you know, I really believe in this stuff, but I have to leave it sort of outside the business because I've got to go and work on this account that I really don't like, but I need the work. And actually, you don't need, you're not, you have the choice now potentially to not be in that position. Yeah. So there are ways in which we can look at the structure of our own businesses yeah. that we're There's helping There's also, and I think what, sorry, <laughs> just to finish, this one no, thing. Uh, what the trust also does is it brings collective will. So when you talk about leadership, yes, but I see the co it's about the collective will of all of us wanting to do something. And actually, a lot of the time, the leaders just get shouted down. And they just, you know, because there is a little bit of structure, unfortunately. But they would just go, no, we're not doing it. And actually, we get ruled, it all gets ruled out. So we have to, okay, well, fine, okay. That's the, they're the benefactors of the trust. So we all have to yeah. do it. I just, I just had a quick point. Actually, someone, I was chatting to one of my team today, and they were saying, actually, we, we changed behavior around smoking. Um, and not just the behavior, but also from an advertising point of view, you just ban advertising on smoking. So if there were certain things that just meant that a lot of these companies didn't have the platform, to your point, Will, about actually stopping the platform for the, for the things that are the worst perpetrators, actually it might stop some of the consumer behavior. It's not gonna go far enough, but I think joining up with media owners, sorry, <laughs> but at, at making sure that there just aren't those platforms. And if everyone had that collective will of, this is just what we're all saying we're not going to do, and we can all build towards that. I think, you know, even if it's only six months time, it might mean that our media plans might change and that in itself might just force the issue. But I think that collective industry-wide force is, is needed. Well, you wanted to just... I was going to say um, that that's exactly why Extinction Rebellion is asking for change by government, legislation change, because a free market, people just aren't going to make these. They're going to sneak about in a back room, right? We all know it. There's loads of agencies doing this shit. It's fucking embarrassing. It's not cool. And because it's not legislated, and we need everyone to rise up and go, yeah, do you know what? It's not good enough that internal industry stuff, you've got to drive towards government, and that's why you all come in, and you all have to help in that. Um, there's a question over here. One of the things I'm finding that's sort of both encouraging and a little bit worrying about all of this is that essentially everyone on the panel, I think, is in fairly violent agreement with some maybe subtle differences of opinion. And, but I think we're in a bubble. So um, I think uh, this is a bubble within the advertising and marketing world. Um, and uh, for all that we might reject briefs from people making gas guzzling, whatever, I'm sure there's someone who'll do it somewhere. Um, and then I think we're also in a bubble because we're in London and you know we live in a certain kind of world. Um, and I think there's, a, there's, there's then a, a, a sort of huge, probably majority, frankly, of, of, of people out there who really aren't engaged and aren't thinking about this and probably haven't even heard of Extinction Rebellion. And, and I mean, I, just a tiny little thing um, that, that I learned last week. Um, I imagine, well, put, put your hand up if you, if you have a reusable water bottle. Great, okay, so that's fantastic. So we did a piece of consumer research last week um, where we asked people about who, who buy plastic bottles on the go about recycling and, and sort of reusable bottles and stuff. And what we discovered was that nobody knew why we were talking to them about plastic bottles. They were like, we kind of heard about straws and plastic bags, and we maybe know something about David Attenborough, and that was where it stopped. These were 16 to 30-year-olds who were kind of out and about all the time. And they, they, they didn't even understand why we were trying to talk to them about that. And when we asked them about it, their engagement stopped with David Attenborough, Greta Thunberg, Extinction Rebellion was nowhere. And, and, and I think that's something that concerns me, and I think, you know, I'd be interested in the, in the panel's views on. Nick, I think this is a, a perfect point to bring you in here. I want, talk to us about how you communicate, you, your audience at, at Lad Bible is, is 
engaged or not engaged with these kinds of issues and how you try and raise awareness with them and how the most appropriate way to talk to, to your audience is about these. And obviously you've had a, a very good example of this with the Trash Isles project which you were behind, which won you know, multiple awards last year. Yeah, um, I guess I completely agree with what you're saying. Um, in terms of why we did a campaign around plastic waste, uh, we actually looked at the insights on uh, our previous content. We knew that uh, the environment and climate change was massively passionate. Our audience were massively passionate about it. Um, however, when we were looking at when we were developing the campaign, like how what's our strategy? Our big thing was not preaching to the converted. We wanted to make sure that you know our audience is outside of the London bubble. Um, I'm from Blackpool. I know that um, when I was speaking before we developed the campaign, just asking friends like just even the sense checking, th th there isn't the same amount of passion as, a, as there is in London, especially in our industry. Um, and it's really important that when we uh, develop campaigns, that we're developing campaigns that speak to everyone. Uh, people don't want to be patronized, they want to be spoken to on the same level. Um, and there is, I think, there is a kind of perception about environmental campaigns uh, from people who are apathetic. They've got the kind of same, uh, like, look and feel sometimes, like I, when we were talking about it, some people mentioned that a lot of the campaigns feature Ben Fogel, um, and it's about like, what, how would you feature, how do you speak to people who are really apathetic, who don't really care about the environment and bring them on board? Um, and for us, one of the big things for us was to, you know, make it simple, make it accessible, give a positive element to the campaign as well. Like, um, people don't want to be fe like fed, obviously it's a very dire situation, uh, but on social media, they still want to feel like there is something positive that they can do, whether it's sharing a post or, you know, changing their habits, however, however basic. Um, but, yeah, I think from our p perspective, it's, it's having something that's really bold and kind of juts away from the kind of normal conventions of high-bro uh, environmental campaigns. And we were talking earlier, and Ian, we were talking about this, that, that these issues, there's a danger of them... Um, dividing almost along class lines, and then you were talking about in the States how this is really dividing along red and blue political lines, that almost anyone on the Republican side is, is, is rejecting any kind of communication and calls for action on this, and it's become so kind of embedded in, in those culture wars, if you like, or that, or that political divide. How are we going to breach that? I have no idea. I, th I think it's the most important thing, right? It's like it can't be the same thing that happens with Brexit. It can't be an us versus them thing. And I re my, the thing that concerns me the most is I watch, you know, I, I completely share your concerns and what you're saying. I, I watched Good Morning the other day, whatever the one is, with Eamon Holmes on it, and they had a travel guy on, and this, you know, poor girl from the Green Party was on, basically got mugged by all these people going, isn't travel wonderful? We should be flying more, not less. And she's kind of tearing her hair out going, fuck me, what's going on? Eamon Holmes is piling in and going, oh, travel, isn't it nice? We should have smaller bags. And you're just like, oh, Christ, like we're totally doomed here. <laughs> but you can just see that that's, you know, they are talking about, like, all these virtue-signaling lefties are basically telling us, that, telling us what to do and denying us hard-working people our chance to go to Benidorm for, or Mallorca. And it's like, and they're already forming those battle lines. And if we don't, if we don't resolve that very quickly, like the whole thing is going to grind to a horrible stalemate again. So we need to get everyone on side. We need to make this everyone's issue and not make it a thing that's only for the liberal elites in London. It has to be a thing that we all care about. And, I, and I'm really, really, that's, that's my biggest fear in all of this is that once, that once those divisions are set up and those like, for the, like the forces of darkness basically manage to kind of divide us, then you know, the battle becomes twice as hard. Rob, you were going to yeah, come, come yeah, in just, and, just, and, and then the rest want to come to you as well. But Rob, Rob you just with this 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 discussion uh, reminds me of um, a quote from an, an ecologist called Paul Holcomb, who's wrote this brilliant book uh, called Drawdown, which is a great book for everyone to understand how you can how you can actually uh, technically make a difference to around climate change. But he he said this isn't a left agenda, this isn't a right agenda, this is a human agenda. And if you think about climate change, as not something that's happening to us, it's something that's happening for us, as in, it's giving us the opportunity to live a better world, like, you see it as an opportunity, see this as a way of how can we live differently, how can we live more in a more positive and more sustainable way, and look at it through that lens, and then you just look at the, you just see the whole, you see opportunities open up in front of you, that's how you look at what's coming down the track. 
Um, there's going to be a, we've got a question here in the audience, but Naresh, I just want to pick up on the piece that you wrote for Creative Review today, actually, which in part was talking about the terms in which we engage with this debate and trying to shift it away from, I think you were talking about the Lord of the Rings borough, the kind of uh, um, altruistic, uh, cliched, sort of green approach to uh, sustainability and issues around the climate in the past and how we need to revolutionise, if you like, the language and the approach to engage with people. Can you talk to us a little bit about, more about that and, and, and how, how we can engage with a wider group of people than, than the converted? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I think what I like about um, language, sort of um, um, uh, words and visual language, is it's very concrete. Um, it's, it's actually um, something very sort of solid and very direct. And that, um, I think sometimes I get a, a, sometimes a little bit lost in the thinking and the, and the conversations, and it's just nice to go do this uh, or do that. And that's um, so thinking about language, I think. Um, I think the language of the environmental, um, of, of, the, of the whole space, I think, um, definitely is, uh, it feels like it's sort of like not fit for purpose right now. Um, you've got Extinction Rebellion who've come along and they've said extinction, rebellion, emergency. You know, that and, um, you know, Greta saying, I want you to panic. And they've gone, we're going to disrupt the language by being, um, you know, very direct, very aggressive. You know, it's um, it's very very strong language, and I think that's great. They're kicking people, you know, kicking people down the road. But I think there's also the other language that needs to happen, which is about putting your arm around people and telling them to come as well. Uh, and I feel that language is sort of very underdeveloped. It's very, um, you know, what Ian was saying about virtue signalling. I think the thing about sort of caring and green and sustainable and generations and next generations and responsibility, and you just go, oh, for God's sake, you know, how's that going to get anyone anywhere? And I think. Um, uh, all, all the things you do have got to be um, either dialed up to the point of emergency or made really, really um, desirable with the same sort of language that makes the problem um, really desirable, which is all the things you can do and fly and buy and all that sort of stuff. So I think the language isn't right around the sector right now, and I think it should change, and I think that will make a, a big difference. Anyone else on the panel want to pick up on that? Nick? I was just going to say about um, the kind of rebranding of veganism, um, and I think that's had a huge shift in the last uh, five years. And actually, you know, Jay Z and Beyonce, they're 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 vegans, so people are becoming vegans not necessarily for environmental reasons or for the care of animals, but you know, for other reasons as well that just aren't as altruistic. So I think it, for some reason. If, you just need to be able to give people more positive reasons to get involved with things and not necessarily have to lean on fear. I was going to say the same, which is people do the right, do the right, the right things for the wrong reasons. So, you know, people don't buy a Tesla because it's going to be good for the environment and it's even good for the environment. We were having that chat earlier. But they do it because it's cool. And I think that's what we have the power to do, which is let's make sure that we're making the things that are going to be better, more attainable, more desirable, um, that, that's the one thing we definitely can do immediately tomorrow um, with the briefs that we've got in our power. Um, there's a question here. Um, thank you for a great discussion. I've really enjoyed it, but I feel like you're all very senior in the companies you work in, and there's been a lot of discussion of what leadership can do. Um, and I feel like a lot of people in this room will be feeling, you know, rightly moved by everything we've heard, but want to feel and understand what they can go away and do. Um, you know, tomorrow morning, 9 a.m., you can all go into your offices and tell your managers that you won't be coming to work on Friday the 20th of September. And you can also then go and tell your CEO that they should give permission for their whole agency to not come to work. Um, I work at the biggest ad agency in Europe, and my agency have given that permission. And that was after a five-minute meeting with my CEO. So if anyone's feeling like they can't act because they're not senior enough, they're not high enough up in their company, then put that aside because I absolutely did not think that a five-minute meeting would lead to her giving permission to the whole company in the all-agency meeting, and she did that. So if anyone wants to chat to me about going and speaking to your CEOs about giving permission for you to all work out on Friday the 20th of September, then please come and chat to me. Thank you. I mean, just on that point of people who might be sitting here thinking, well, what can I do? Um, Naresh, again, and come to you, you know, you, you've written in the past about some very practical things that people can 
actions that people can take at whatever level they are within organizations. And through your Do the Green Thing project, you're, you're trying to sp spread that message very effectively. So, so tell us about some of the suggestions that you have. Um, I was going to say, can I say something else first? Yeah, yeah. Um, because I think um, I, I, I'm very struck by that question about, um, you know, yes, you know, we're reasonably um, experienced stroke senior here. And yes, um, you know, 50 leaders, leaders, I guess, have signed um, the, uh, the uh, Creighton Strike um, petition. Uh, and I, I suppose my, my worry about it is, I mean, this is all, this is progress, this is great. We're having a good discussion, a, gr a, group, of, a group of agencies are signed up to this thing, which is fantastic, and well done. Uh, brilliant for speaking to your CEO, and brilliant that you, you did it, and brilliant your CEO said, yes, you can, stri you can strike, right? That's what they told you? Yeah. Fantastic. Um, but I think the, the, for me, the, my, my worry is that um, the, the business is about um, making money. Um, the business is also about sounding good. That's what we do. We sort of spin things, you know. That's, and I think it's very easy to say the right things and also then carry on making the money. Um, and so I think um, the trouble with, um, this is probably going to sound really dumb, but the, the trouble with senior people is they're the people who make the most money and they've got the most to lose. Um, and that's an unsympathetic view. Maybe a more sympathetic view is that um, they're supporting an economy, which is their agency. They're concerned about people's lives. Um, you know, they've got targets to meet. And maybe it's for more, um, you know, less self-centered and more altruistic reasons. But, um, you know, the, the, the thing is that the, the thing that agencies can do, um, whether it's about, um, you know, doing practical green actions in your own workplace, about saying no to certain clients that contribute to um, global warming irrefutably, like oil, like fast fashion, like meat, and so on and so on, microbead, anything, etc. Um, and then saying yes to either the projects that are out there that are about doing the right thing or going, I'm going to divert, di di you know, direct divert resources to helping this campaign or this NGO. They all cost money. And I think that's the hardest thing for some CEOs or some senior people to sign off. Um, so I, I think that's the problem, isn't it? If you've got um, the people who are most powerful are the people with the most to lose. Um, and... So you know. w within Pentagram, Peter, I'll come, I'll come to you in a second, but within Pentagram, you, you've got your the Do the Green Thing project, which is ra you know, raising a lot of these questions and putting a, um, raising a lot of these issues. Where are the tensions within Pentagram in terms of the work that the rest of the organization is doing? How do you try and influence the rest of the organization? And where occasionally do you butt heads about, well, what should we be doing as a business? Um, well, um I think actually it's um, Pentagram supports Do the Green Thing. It supports my team to do it, so it is behind it, but not everything Do the Green Thing says or asks is what Pentagram does. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's a platform where everyone's independent, and I think that's really important to say. Um, I mean, on the good side, I think um, it is thinking about the issues. I've been to, like, for example, I went to speak in New York at Pentagram um, New York and told them about all the things we were doing, said that thing that you... Um, said Natalie about some types of work needs to need to be illegal, you know, light cigarettes, what are the new cigarettes, why, aren't, why isn't this stuff banned until it's banned, come on, let's, you know, and uh, Michael Beirut, and there were no questions at the end, it was a lunchtime talk, and Michael Beirut said, you just spun everyone out, basically, they're thinking one way in one framework, and I think you've spun them out, and I think they're thinking about it, but the great thing is, at least they're thinking about it, we're, ha we're starting to have that discussion, which I think is good. Peter, you wanted to pick up on something. Well, there's, a, there's a different answer to your question. First of all, well done you. So one person can do an amazing thing. And I think that's fantastic. I love that you are now ready to give advice to other people. That's brilliant. But you can do something collectively. I look out here and I see a creative department. Okay, I asked Will uh, at the beginning if there's any, what could we do? What would be useful to him? And he said, forgive me if I, if I get this wrong, but, you, um, but he said, uh, we got loads of volunteers initially when we wrote the letter. And then when we got into it, people said, yeah, I could do like one day a month. And one day a month isn't really any use to Extinction Rebellion. Yeah. But, or it's, it's not, sorry, it's not yeah. as useful. Yeah. But OK, well, what I would suggest is that um, anybody uh, seen that little Kendall Tarrant um, freelance app? Have we done that thing? It's basically an app. It phones you up in the morning, so there's a job working on next. Do you want to do it, yes or no? And you click yes or no. And if you click yes, you go through and you 
become one of the people that offer it to you. I look out at this bunch of people and say that we're in the DNAD building. DNAD uh, is the home of uh, innovative, creative thinking. As a group of people, you've all given up your evening to come here and sit and listen to us. I think that's amazing. You all come here with one of those three skills, words, pictures, and insights. If you wanted to volunteer, all it would really take is for somebody at DNAD to work out, like somebody old who's got time to select the work and somebody smart who's got time to write the brief. I, I think that, um, let me take a tiny tangent, okay. Uh, since 2000, 130,000 people have been lifted out of extreme poverty. Every fucking day. Okay, there are a billion people on this planet who are no longer abjectly poor because of a bunch of things. A lot of it is technology, okay? A lot of it is the way that we were able to make people have a living. But I think that what you have in this room are skills that can be applied to change the way that we behave. We used to smoke, we used to be homophobic, we used to be racist. This is still a fairly white um, <laughs> group of people, but those things have all changed, are changing. We used to be able to treat women very badly in the workplace, and then inside 18 months, um, uh, anybody who feels that way is terrified for their very living. We can change opinion, that's why we all got into this business. And I would say the answer to your question is volunteer to be part of a collective creative solution to whatever problem they throw out. I think there will come a point where lying down in the road is, is not enough. And when that's the case, well, maybe I'm speaking for you now, I'm just going to shut up. No, I mean, it's great. This is, we, we definitely need people with great communication skills to come and work inside of Extinction Rebellion as Extinction Rebellion. Uh, it's cool being like, yeah, I'll do them a favor, but it's not the same as getting involved. It's the single most amazing, cool movement thing I've seen in a long time. The access you get to, we can just call up anyone in the world and go, oh, hi, we're Extinction Rebellion, do you want to have a chat? And everyone's like, yeah, fucking definitely do that. So if you want to expand your like reach of ideas and you want to work with a celebrity or you want to work with the world's top basketball player or you've got an idea, we can just call them. We've got that now. Everyone's up for it. Everyone realizes this is happening and that we're all in a deeply, deeply fucked state. So we need to kind of begin to leverage that. So if you've got ideas, come and join us. Come and get inside what we're doing. Get your head around this. Get over the grieving process and be held by a group of other people who think in the same way. If you can't afford to give up your job full time, so no, 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 just he like, do rides it. a bike and has no money. But you can do it sometime. We can maybe work out a way of... I don't have any money. Just because he rides a bike doesn't mean he hasn't got any money. Though. I was just saying that. No, but he did say that. It was actual words. I don't have any money. <laughs> um, we've got a sure. question here in the audience. Actually, you already touched on it just a little bit just then. But my question is, um, it, I, I'm not from the advertising industry, um, but it all, all of the conversation sounds quite reactive. It's like we can say yes to good briefs and no to bad briefs. And if we say no, then someone else is going to take on that brief. But is there space, and I don't know the answer to this, for people to come together and to create movement? So exactly the cigarette. Um, example. So why are we waiting for government legislation to say this is bad? Like, you can all do that yourselves with, using creative ideas. Surely, well, come so together. You, you had a good point about agencies rediscovering their agency and not waiting for, for briefs. Exactly, not waiting for briefs. You know, what, what if we sort of flipped our worldview and once we understand the reality of what's, ha what's happening, what if we ask ourselves, what do we do? And, and if we, what happens when we act from that space? And do we have that understanding? How do we, and how do we respond to that? I'm not waiting for clients. Yeah, but we claim our own agency and respond to that. But I just wanted to sort of um, also talk about this. Um, I don't know, just having a discussion about what can we do. So with Purpose Disruptors, we're about collecting, creating that, um, that bottom of movement. Um, and out of that first summit, we've got a number of ideas. And the Create and Strike was just one of those ideas that's come up. And one of perhaps more emerging and more powerful ideas that we invite everyone in this room to be, to be part of. And actually we're holding a second summit this, this, this coming Monday, we can talk to you about. But the idea is around how, if we can, for every brief that comes in to a client, we respond with a sustainable brief. We respond with the brief that, that leads to a positive future for, for uh, that, that consumers can live. So making that the norm. And that's an idea that's building, that discussions are happening at the IPA, um, at the Advertising Association, where how can we make this like a thing? How can we make this like, like you know, a thing that industry can, can, can understand and, and works on? So it becomes just normal that every brief we respond to with that sustainable response. And so, Nick, that comes naturally. I mean, that's the entire yes. agency message, frankly, on that basis for 20 years. Yeah. 
And actually, when we, in 2006, we wrote a little book called 10 Ways Design Can Combat Climate Change. And the first one was rewrite the brief. So very apt. Can I just say, there's one thing. I get slightly worried when people say, let's make sustainability cool. I don't, you know, it's because it's something that we often talk about, you know, you know, let's pull our creative powers together and make it like everyone wants to do it. Um, I, I don't know if it's just me, but I kind of remember that that did, it happened 10 years, I'm just showing my age again, but, um, and what, ten, what came out of that was greenwash. And so you have to be super, super careful. It's not a product. This is actually a, the way we're going to be living and the climate. So actually we do have to be, you can't just apply a language of, of communicate or like you know advertising language onto this issue this is everything this is about you know the planet that we're living on this is about our future so you, we have to be really careful about it and it's like how we play it and how we really connect to people properly is absolutely from the heart i think yeah, so, so I think it's a, it's a very interesting discussion, also starting from this gentleman over there who said, we're in a bubble, right? So how do we actually communicate people outside this room, outside this bubble? I think that's a very interesting question and, and very important because when, when, we, when we think about people who don't believe in climate change, we can't just say, you're stupid or, well, but science, right? So, so if you throw numbers at them, I don't think that's very appealing or if, if, you, if you say, well, the Amazon is on fire and, and the Arctic and, and Indonesia. Uh, so that, that's petrifying, like, like Nick said, right? So, so Sophie, you also said, it, we, we have to think about what inspires people. And, and that's what the advertising industry does really well, appealing to the heart rather than just throwing numbers at people. So how can we do that? I, I think, sorry, just to kind of, sorry. Oh, just a really quick one, which is uh, a little bit back to, um, I guess, what Nick was saying, which is you, you make sure that you're making the things cool that they, people didn't even realize that it's not about selling sustainability. I completely agree. But So we did a campaign with Ecova. At, at, at the back of, at back of the bottles on most cleaning products, it says, will harm aquatic life. Once you know that, you can't go back. But the way you sell Ecova, which doesn't do that, to people is not to say this is the one that doesn't harm aquatic life. You just make that the one that everyone wants to buy. And, and I think that's, they're the sorts of bits I guess <coughs> we need to get to, which is making sure we're helping those brands go front and center versus an alternative. Um, and, and I guess to what Sophie's spent the last 21 years saying, we, you know, we, we've, we, uh, we feel like you need to find a way. So what are the things that are problems? So we started a coffee brand that is um, ecologically sustainable. It's like a Nespresso capsule um, that works like a tea bag. Um, but for us, that isn't going to get around the problem. But the reality is if people are still drinking Nespresso that's harmful for the environment, let's at least find a more eco-friendly way of doing it. There's, there's ways that we can use our collective power to just shift that without saying we're selling sustainability to people. I can completely agree. Um, well, I'm not in, from the commercial team, so I don't have a huge amount of uh, interactions with brands. However, they, they, they do come to us following the campaign and ask us about how to communicate with young people about social issues, which obviously environment is one. Um, and I think what uh, a lot of brands forget is the power of social media um, and how, how people react on social. Um, if you're looking on Instagram, if you're looking on Facebook, you literally have a few seconds to stop you in the tracks and stop you going down and looking at other parts of the newsfeed. Um, and it's really important that you get that hook straight away. Um, but with most people, for our audience, for young people, they are savvy now. Um, they, can, they can smell a brand that's doing it for the wrong reasons a mile away. Um, and for young people, obviously, they don't have a huge amount of trust in some of these big established brands. Um, so the, the, it goes back to thinking about social media and thinking about humanizing the issue, having a personal conversation between your brand or the uh, p person that represents your brand to that audience um, and explaining the situation in a way that's accessible, um, that's um, really easy to follow, but also 
isn't finger wagging and isn't actually making them feel that they're to blame because I think we've done a huge amount of research with young people via like quant research and also doing focus groups up around the UK. Um, and the intention for young people is there. They just find it really hard to live, you know, 100%, um, you know, ethically, really. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I had a, an idea to share, but also just a little, um, just a, some, someone that's been sort of heavily immersed in a lot of this stuff for a good decade and in and out of grief and breakdown and everything else and a dad and all these things, but as a human, really. But it doesn't surprise me that we're in this situation and it doesn't surprise me that people like kids don't know about plastic bottles and why that's a problem because we're, we're kind of ecologically illiterate as a, as a culture um, and that's not our fault. That's just the way that we've been institutionalized through the way we learn about stuff. So um, there was a great systems thinker, Gregory Bates, and he said the difference, the major problems in this world are caused by the difference between how people think and how nature works. And th that, for me, sort of s sums it up. Um, we're in this kind of crisis right now where culture meets nature. That's what's causing um, this culture that we're part of, industrial growth society, this pursuit constantly of materials-based economies. And that's the reality. So I think it actually needs um, response that's embedded in that reality. Um, and so therefore joined up thinking. We've been running an experiment through a project I do called Good, Good For Nothing, which is about how do you mobilize creativity to support the youth strikers. That was a little experiment we've done. Lots of people in this room have been involved in that, but there's about a dozen projects that have been created alongside people's day-to-day -day work that are trying to mobilize all sorts of people out into the streets. And the youth movements are worth watching because this is their future and this thing is building and they're not gonna give a shit about anything else in uh, probably in a year's time. But the joined up thinking, we're thinking, um, is there a day a week now that we could start committing? People are talking about four day weeks. What if there was a day a week for joined up thinking? And there's models to look at. If you look at someone like Joanna Macy's work, she talks about very clear actions to work with. One is holding actions. How do you slow down the destruction of what is left of our ecosystems? And you do that by, by holding off the bad shit. And there's a massive role for this industry in that space, dropping toxic clients, creating culture why we need to move away from these things. And then there's another piece, which is creatively reimagining life-supporting systems. So everything that we do in the world needs to be reimagined. What's beyond consumption? What's beyond that stuff? To do that, a day a week, we're suggesting poster strikes to start convening people that want to work on these strategically. We're working with Will and with everyone. This is about a collective action. It's so easy. I mean, I've been running a thing called Good For Nothing. It's terrible for making money out of. Right? It's possible, we're, we're so privileged in this room, it's so possible to reduce our incomes, what we need, and start freeing up intentional space to do stuff. So that's what I'm saying, if you're interested, give us a shout. I just want to say, um, many, many years ago, I worked for The Body Shop, and we had every Wednesday afternoon off to support a uh, social, um, activity of our, of our choice, as in campaigning, writing letters, distributing petitions as it was in those days. That was embedded in that company's culture and one took about 1990, so it can be done. Um, can I quickly just ask one, yeah, say one thing okay. on that? Um, I was a bit saddened when you said that our language is all doom and gloom. I think when I talk about it here in this space, I'm, you know, we, I, I, I can say stuff about we're fucked, you know, you can pick up a newspaper and hear that, right? read that, but no one wants to, you know, you can hear it from Greta, you can hear it from David Attenborough, you can hear it from climate scientists. It's a tough message to get your head around. And all of these things shout at us going, do you know what, if you're gonna do something, do it now, because this is the time to do it. And whether, what kind of language we use, I think is, or challenging us on the language is a, is a failure to grasp the issue itself. And it's a form of denial and I think it's, um, it's an easy way out of going, oh, th this isn't for me, oh, those guys aren't, oh, you know, I can't, I've... I'm sorry, like, if you've been to any of the Extinction Rebellion protests, and I'm not defending Extinction Rebellion, because I, all I was gonna say was that I think that visioning something better is what makes this work, and it's what's got us this far as a movement. And I wondered, can anyone raise a hand who came down in April to any of the rebellion activity we did? And did you, any of you think it was not a positive experience? Did anyone find it to be a sort of negative 
Because I think we turned four lanes of traffic into a, you know, a street party, and we, turned, we put a big pink boat in the middle of town. This is not a, a place where the language of depressing language takes over. This is a place where we're using words like hope, empathy, well, maybe not hope, empathy, frugality, love. You know, like, this is stuff which is uncommodifiable language, unfortunately, because we're saying words like frugality, but it's done in a positive space with bright, distinctive colors, and I think quite iconic design. Again, I'm not saying this from a place of deep defense of Extinction Rebellion. I'm just saying that I think that, like, if the language is a hurdle for you, it's because you haven't got your head around how the, the crisis itself I wasn't being I wasn't being critical of your language. I was actually saying well done for, you know, raising the emergency. I mean you I mean you say hope, that's fine. I know there's plenty of stuff that you do uh in the um initiatives and um the things that uh the, the various campaigns and the way you've written your book. Um and I know there's a lot of hope in the movement, but basically you start with something called extinction and rebellion. So you're saying something that's happening now has to stop, otherwise we're all screwed and you, you've declared a state of emergency, right? So you don't start with hope. And I'm saying, I'm saying, actually, that's a really good thing because you know, the IPP, IPPC, IPCC, you, and Greta, and ITFES, and all those people have actually said, look what's happening, it's a disaster, now get going, right? So someone has to do that, someone has to put that light on, that blinking light on, and you've done that, and that's with fantastic, lang I mean, fantastic language. Yes, you've got brilliant stuff that comes after that that's more hopeful, but it's really great what you've done. I, I think it's really strong. Oh. Hi. Um, so, <clears throat> just something that struck me um, listening to the conversation, talking about things like language, and I kind of think the way that we talk about the bubble is really problematic, like we're this enlightened center, because um, I know that Extinction Rebellion is sort of spread around the country, and I, want, I know that there's going to be like top-down solutions to working with your clients top-down, but we're also neighbors, you know, children, brothers, sisters, etc. And I wonder if there's also something to be done about actually taking the skills that we've all individually got and going to our neighborhood, Extinction Rebellion. Um, I live in Romford, and the Havering Council was the first council in Britain to say that there wasn't a, a climate emergency, which is great. It's not going to affect Romford. Um, but I discovered through that that, you know, Havering's got his Extinction Rebellion Havering, and they're doing stuff on a local level. So, um, yeah, I just wonder if there's so much talent and skill, and yeah, we're going to come together as an industry, but also we can take what we've got from the industry and go back to our streets and go back to our neighbours, and just as a perspective shift, because I just think the bubble, there are people outside this bubble who care. You know, it's not like, oh, I thought I found the Benidorm comment a bit, uh, because, you know, we see our colleagues and friends on Instagram in glamorous places. You know, why is that any better than going to Ben Dorm? I don't know. So, sorry, <laughs> rant. Um, there's a question over here. Hi. Um, I struggle with the bubble piece as well. Um, one of our clients, we've got lots of mainstream clients, one of our clients is Morrison's. Uh, in their data, uh, it suggests that customers, one of the top things they're concerned about is single-use plastics. Um, so Dave Potts, CEO, has made it his mission as a business objective to take plastic off as many things as he possibly can. Dave Lewis has done the same at Tesco. Uh, but I think those guys, what they're doing is they're putting a tangible target on things and therefore action happens. Um, where I struggle slightly with kind of like the rebellion piece is what is the target? Obviously there's a big target of change, but can the collective brains in the room, in advertising and communications kind of articulate a target that is tangible and achievable, um, and then everybody can kind of get behind that in the same way that big businesses know that their brand is their business and they're doing something about it. Thanks. Does anyone want to respond to that, using using targets as a mechanism to, to uh, create change? Yeah, you could do carbon net zero by 2025. That would be good. I don't know. I, I, what do you want? There's, lo there's lots of targets, and I don't know if that helps people, because... <laughs> We could we could all kind of make up different targets. I think there's just I don't know. Apologies if my Benidorm thing came across a certain way. It wasn't supposed to be that. I was doing an impression of the guys on Good Morning Britain. 
The, the elephant in the room here is that actually some of the changes that we're talking about are so much more profound than the, than the kind of targets that we're talking about now and, and the, the level of change that we're going to have to instigate. Like, I was at a thing the other day about, about sustainable fashion and you kind of go, actually sustainable fashion's an, an oxymoron in itself, right? You can't have fashion where there's cycles of things that you want it and then you don't want it and you throw it away. And I think sometimes we're just giving lip service to all of these initiatives which are like, and I don't want to say that not everything's pointless, but lots of these things are literally like putting band-aids on gangrenous amputated legs. You know, we need to be much, much more like progressive. I think, Dan, what you're saying about kind of what's the vision of the thing that we're putting out there? And lots of people are like, how do you make those visions of like what the level of change that we're going to have to go through? How do you make those things feel positive and attainable and something like we all, like we all want and need in our lives rather than something that's going to be done to us by other people? And I think taking that kind of agency and going, let's get together and like figure out what that thing looks like, make it as bloody appealing as we can because actually when you start to do some work around it you go oh like wait i'm stuck in this thing earning this money so i can buy this stuff to show off to my friends on instant like somebody put it brilliantly earlier you go, yeah, that's a ridiculous waste of all my time like i could work one day a week basically not want as much stuff spend more time with my family, more time outdoors in nature. Oh, actually, all of those things sound pretty bloody good, don't they? Mm -hmm. And so I just, I, I think it's like, how do you, it's really hard from inside the machine to kind of disrupt the machine. And so it's what are the things that get us out of the day-to-day -day thinking, get us looking back on what we're doing and going, oh my God, this is absolutely ridiculous. Let's think about it like fundamentally differently because, you know, th those things are going, oh, well, the answer to this is to buy something else. Like, instead of having a plastic straw, I'm going to buy a metal straw. Love metal straws better than plastic straws, for sure. But, like, the answer to things can't be just let me buy a newer, better mm -hmm. version of that thing. It's like we have to, as you were saying, Peter, like, it's about less. And it's about figuring out, like, what actually... I had a debate with a friend of mine. I was using the language of less, and he was like, it's a bit negative. And he was like, what about enough? And I'm like, that's an interesting question. Like, what is enough? And I think we've all broken our kind of what is enough switch. And social media and everything kind of makes us desire more the whole time. And we just need to kind of look at things in a completely different, very positive light, I hope. And here's a, a creative challenge. How do you make living with less not feel like loss? And that's the question that, that a lot of us hold in our network. Um, and to the point you were making, Ian, you you know, we can't expect the level of thinking that got us into this mess to get us out of this mess. You know, it requires sort of really transformational thinking. And the point you were making, Dan, around you know, the question that what I hold is, is this about just changing people's behaviors and attitudes come second? Or is it what I'm starting to connect with? Is it about getting people to understand that we are not separate from the rest of the planet? We're not separate from the rest of the living systems. We are connected to the whole. And it's that, that shift in thinking that a lot of us believe is required to actually create the change that's necessary for us to sort of live within planetary boundaries. Okay, we have can uh, I, one can more I make just a quick, um, sorry, just yeah, a quick plea yeah. that, I mean, I think that's absolutely right. The only thing I would ask people to do is not forget the, the things that work when we sold things that we didn't need. I think we have to remember that you can only get people to change their behavior by, again, getting them to do one of three things. You've got to make them laugh, cry, or think. And I think sometimes the conversation gets so serious that it does. I think to your question earlier on, it, we lose people not necessarily inside or outside a bubble, but just people who don't understand why it's important. And I think that we can use our skills as uh, artists and um, wordsmiths to make it seem, ex I mean, I, I love that uh, less isn't lost. I think that's really a really good example of trying to simplify the argument until people get it. One of the things that you, I'm sorry to speak like an agency leader again, but the, um, just when you're sick of saying something is when people start to get it. Our business is a repetition business. We find a really simple statement by working with our strategists. We find the most sticky way of making it um, appeal to a human being, and then we say it again and again and again. And, and that was, for me, what's important to, uh, to keep in mind the things that are going well. I mean, I'm really, I'm really you know, sort of a little bit in love with Will. I think it's really in, in, interesting the way that he's used raw passion and aggression and simplicity to say, no, no, it's not later, it's now. I think that's a brilliant job, not one that's finished. But I think around that, we can start to advertise, promote a life which is just as satisfying as Ian was saying, and make it feel like progress.
So I, oh, it's a long way of saying don't, we can't bore people into changing their behavior. Oh, you're going to hate this then. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got a quote here that really troubled me, so I wanted to read it to you and share and see if it troubles the rest of you. And then uh, my phone's gone weird. Um, so this is Pavan Sukhdev, who's an amazing man. He's a renegade economist who works with the EU and the Indian government on valuing biodiversity. He's now the president of the WWF. And he says, uh, by converting human insecurities into wants, wants into needs, needs into demands, demands into production, production into profit, advertising executives are destroying the fabric of humanity in our society. I think the time has come to call a hold to this, to call a spade a spade. Advertising has to be about information and communication less about persuasion and bullshit. So my question is, is it time for a vow of chastity? Lars von Trier's confronted the film industry and declared dog me films and a vow of chastity and taking all the Hollywood bullshit out of films. Should we have a vow of chastity? We don't all have to follow it, but how do we respond to that? Because I've, I've met the guy, I loved him, but I didn't know he hated me and I feel stricken <laughs> <laughs> and that we might want to respond. Anyone want to respond to that? Can I just mention boycotts really quickly? Um, we're running one of them at the moment, a fashion boycott, which is encouraging people to stop buying clothes for a year. And the thing about a boycott is that once you've done it for a year, you, you, you don't notice it anymore. You just go, well, that's just my life's moved on. Change has happened. People have got a great plasticity of thought and they you know, moved and changed. There's also a big move at the moment in Sweden to make flying seem toxic and to make everyone wake up to the fact that you know, it's one of the few levers we have available in our activities and normalized lives in which you can do something about this and you, everyone's saying stop that for a year i've stopped it for almost a year now i take the train and it's like different but it's completely doable i think and maybe people who live all over the world i'm not saying this is for everyone but i think that the places the times i've been abroad to places like i went to lisbon which at the time didn't have any adverts for some reason I guess their economy was in a hole and no one was bothering to advertise or going to uh, Japan at one point I've got a terrible carbon footprint and I couldn't understand any of the adverts and they've been the times when I've been most relaxed in my life because I wasn't being bombarded subliminally with messages out of the corner of my eyes for things that weren't targeted at me or even if they were weren't appropriate and just these constant bombarding of images without that when it's just a sort of visual display, I found it extremely relaxing. So I think that maybe, a, let's see, I, I can imagine a year without advertising and seeing how we've all moved on. <laughs> We're out of time, but you can stay around, continue these conversations. There are drinks, there are nibbles. Um, before I forget, I want to mention two things. One is that if you're still struggling with actions to take, things that you can do, Extinction Rebellion have written a very handy handbook so take inspiration from this. It's available in all good bookstores and some terrible ones as well. <laughs> and the other thing I want to just uh, mention is that um, Accept and Proceed have organized um, an auction to benefit Extinction Rebellion. It's called the Rebel Art Auction. They've asked a bunch of very talented uh, designers and illustrators and creative people to uh, create uh, works which are going to be... Um, auctioned off on the 13th of September uh, to benefit Extinction Rebellion. So uh, if you take a look at um, Rebel Art Auction, or um, I'm sure if you Google it, you'll find where to go to, uh, to take part in that auction. Other climate movements are available. It's not just us. <laughs> okay, last, last one. Have the microphone. Here will be striking on the 20th, or indeed coming out on the 7th, and whether DNAD will be as well, and whether there's been a call to action to, you know, from DNAD to the creative industries to do that. I was just going to say something about that actually, yeah. um, which is um, please strike um, and tell people you're striking. Um, you have your, you, your advocates and you've got networks, um, and just get the word out. We're protesting against the system, we're protesting against um, media and business and governments who've got the wrong framework, and we need to tell them to have the right one. Um, and if you want something to strike with, um, there's a, I don't know if this is from the bubble, or if I'm a bubble person, I have no idea anymore, um, but uh, Studio Moros created a really great thing, which is an OOO graphic that says OOO for the planet, put it on your email, take it off Do the Green Thing or off Creative Review this morning, and then it will tell other people who are trying to get in touch with you, who are trying to do work on that Friday, not to. Um, so it's a really good thing. I think um, the studio did something fantastic for us. 
So use it. But and strike. I and I promise you I will speak to the powers that be at DNAD. Um, yes, we have a, we, oh, we have a statement. There we go. Hello, everyone. My name is Matt. Um, I'm in the marketing team here at DNAD. Um, on the note made earlier, I actually made a call to DNAD today to strike next week. Um, as far as I'm aware, it's going up to the board tomorrow, and we probably will be striking. On that note, thank you to our enormous super mega panel for coming along this evening. And thank you all, thank you all for the fantastic contributions we've had tonight. Um, tonight's session has been videoed, so look out for the video on DNAD's channels and elsewhere in the future. But do please stay around and continue the conversation. Thank you all so much for coming.